Really glad to be here. You know, PyCon is my favorite conference all year. I can't express how happy it makes me to be here. I honestly, I ha was sort of in a crappy mood right before I came, and being at PyCon just makes me. It, it's a unique place. You know, being here with so many good, smart, and wonderful people is just just an amazing thing. So several months back, I put out a call asking for topics for this talk. What did people want to hear? And I got back a number of responses, both on Twitter and in email. So my favorite was actually from David Beasley. Uh, he suggested that I do nothing but watch Samuel Beckett plays, and then it doesn't really matter what I talk about. <laughs> so David, you'll be happy to know I did watch a lot of Samuel Beckett plays. I think the one that I remember most was a Python-themed version of Waiting for Godot called Waiting for 2.8. <laughs> uh, I don't want to ruin it for anyone who hasn't seen it, but 2.8 never comes. Uh, I also got one that was from, uh, from Nick about I know holds barred account of what we're learning about running the PSF. And this was actually a surprisingly hard question to answer because, frankly, we do a lot of stuff. How could I organize it? How could I explain what it is that the PSF does? And so I thought it would be easiest to explain by comparing the Python community to a corporation. So if we have the Python community, that's all of us together, and we would, of course, have uh, product development and strategy. You know, that's Python core dev. And we have an R&D department. Um, we have uh, enterprise integration. Uh, we would also have uh, we would also have libraries and SDKs. We have add-ons and tooling. We and of course all of you are developer advocates and evangelists. So right now above this line, everything there is generally what you would call capitalizable. That's a long way of saying in corporate speak, the people who do that stuff above the line build valuable things. Everything that's going to go below this line is what we call GNA, or general and administrative expense. This is overhead. <laughs> the PSF is what takes care of this stuff, and you've heard of these groups. These are the groups that everybody loves to hate. So what are these? Um, the PSF is IT, uh, PyPI, Py.org. Uh, how about finance? Uh, accounting, legal, uh, human resources, events and logistics. You're in one of the events that we do logistics for. Uh, public relations, sales and marketing. This is what the PSF does. We actually have significant efforts in all of these areas and more. And so, but this is supposed to be a whole, no holds barred look at all this stuff. So I actually want to talk about not just what we do, but what the problems are. Now, the hard part about being in the PSF, to be honest, is it's people work. There are thousands and thousands of people, and ultimately you need to be, in some sense, responsible for trying to help everybody. And if you get five developers in a room and ask them about which editor they should use, you'll get six opinions. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about some... So our, a lot of our key issues are about people. So I'm going to tell you what these problem areas are and, importantly, what you can do about them. So the first, the first issue is actually time. The PSF, as an organization, is, is strapped for time. It has exactly one full-time employee and three part-time employees. Uh, everyone else at the PSF and those who are working at PSF-sponsored events, like here at PyCon, are all volunteers. Even for those who are paid, those few people who are paid, they give way more than it, they would give for just an ordinary job. Now, I am not complaining about this, but on a concrete level, the people working on PSF stuff are limited. There are far more things that we would like to do that we just don't have time to do. And even when we have people who step up to help, 
managing and communicating and overseeing and helping and doing all of those people management things take time. And it's difficult to actually do all those things and get the primary work done as well. So what can you do? The first thing that I'd like each one of you to do is to say thanks. Find someone with a staff shirt, buy them a beverage. Find somebody who has written that library that you just couldn't live without or that you learned from. Tell them what that meant to you. All of us have a human need to be appreciated and the people that are in the Python community serve you. And they do it just for all, signs of re all kinds of reasons, but reach out and make sure that you say thank you. The second thing, the best thing that you can do individually to help the Python community is to reach out and lift and mentor others. Because there isn't time for everybody to, uh, for the PSF, just the few people who uh, are in the board or whatever, to raise up everybody. There are always new people. It doesn't matter if they're too new to Python or they're new to, to your meetup or they're new to your mailing list. Welcome them in and show them the ropes. Bonus points if you help someone out who doesn't look like you. And third, for those who are trying to work with others in the PSF, we need you to persevere and to be understanding. I heard the story of a new contributor yesterday who tried to reach out and make a contribution. And this was in a project, basically, uh, this was a contribution to pi.org, which, uh, which we have responsibility for. And she felt turned off because it was hard to contribute. Now, no one was mean, but no one made the time to go out and help her get over the hump. Now, the good news is that she persevered, she landed some code, and she got over that hump. Now, there shouldn't, it shouldn't be there, but it is. So when you're reaching out, please make sure you persevere, understand that everybody is trying as hard as they can, and we, even if we don't always respond, we want you. So the second thing I'd like to talk about is empathy. It may seem strange that I'm talking about empathy, but I think that the single biggest resource, the thing that we miss the most in the, the Python community and computing in general is empathy. And by empathy, I mean a willingness to place yourself in another person's shoes and try to see the world through their eyes. A lack of empathy is expressed through being dismissive of others, uh, for labeling others without without understanding their point of view and where they're coming from. It doesn't matter if you agree or not. It doesn't matter if that person is wrong. It only matters if you try to understand that person and where they come from and their context and in the context of their lived experience. You know, this is one of my favorite quotes from Banksy. Who knows Banksy? As I think about it, every single person is the hero of their own story. What I mean by that is that each person, from in the context of where they are, they try to do good. They are they're overcoming their own obstacles, they're slaying their own dragons, they are trying as hard as they can. And when something comes across to you that you think, why are they doing this? This is so wrong-headed. You don't really understand until you can put yourself in their shoes and understand why they think that thing that they're doing is good and it's valuable. They are the hero of their own story. You need to understand why they think their contribution is valuable. Yes, there are trolls. There, and we should eject, eject people who are regularly abusive to others from our community. We don't put up with that. But those are one in a hundred or one in a thousand. That's not most people. Let me tell you a true story. There are a few people in every community that I'm in that I just don't agree with. I cannot, no matter what they think, I'm pretty much sure I'm going to think the opposite. But behind those few people, I realize there are many others who think the same way they do. 
And I am grateful to those people because I learn more from the people who disagree with me than all the people who agree with me. So what can you do to increase empathy? So first, stop labeling. Give, bef- wait before you attach to people or will la- attach labels to people or to conduct or to arguments that don't take into account the content and context of what that person is saying. It's okay to have these labels. They're meaningful to you. But, make sure, but if you want to connect with a person, you need to reach out and start from where they are, not from where you are. Also, always give people the benefit of the doubt. One of the difficult things in our society is that more and more of what we do comes through pixels and not from people. People have said that almost 80% or 90% of what we do actually comes through nonverbal communication. All of that is cut out when we post things on the internet or when we send an email. So it's always so easy to misunderstand. This doesn't excuse things when people get hurt. As Jacob Kaplan Moss correctly pointed out to me, intent isn't magic. But we should always, always assume that people are trying to do good and strive to understand others in that light. The third piece is responsibility. This is, this is a hard one because we have many people who are willing to criticize what, how something is done. Many of those criticisms are correct, but we don't take the time to reach out and figure out how to engage constructively. And truth be told, I find great value in being told when I'm in wrong. But too many of us stop when we've raised our voice to complain and we don't take responsibility for the next step. At a minimum, work out what could be done better. Does this mean that if you don't like a library that you need to become a core maintainer? Of course not. But it does mean that we need to take responsibilities for the burdens that we put upon others. There was a thread recently where a longtime and prolific contributor to the Python community talked about how people came and insisted that he make changes to his library that he did, that he may not agree with, and how he felt put upon and almost angry because these people did not take responsibility for understanding the burdens that they put on him. They they felt entitled to criticize and insist. This is not good enough. It's a failure of empathy. It's a failure of responsibility, and it's got to stop. So what can you do? Number one, it's important that we all do our homework. Find a way. People are always trying to do their best. Is there a problem out there that has prevented someone from doing what you say? You should always try and investigate first. Don't just jump to, hey, Can you do this for me? Find out first. Second, take a look. Is there a way that you can engage constructively, try and solve the problem yourself? Do that. And then third, do you still think you need to speak out? Isolate the change that needs to be made so that your feedback is constructive and actionable. Hey, it doesn't work is not a bug report, and this sucks is not a feature request. (laughs) So that was pretty heavy. So... um, We're going to pause right now for a rainbow butterfly unicorn kitten. Okay, so ready. So what advice do we have for younger open source projects that want to grow to be the PSF? Well, this is an interesting one. I'd say first, don't rush it. The PSF has had the, the, the luxury of growing up incrementally over a long period of time, and I think that that is actually the best way to go. You don't need to overdo the process or overdo the ceremony very early. Yes, you want to set ru- ground rules and expectations early on, but make processes as lightweight and as informal as possible until they start to strain, and then you can improve them. The second thing is default to openness. But remember that openness is not actually an end to in itself. Openness is simply the beginning of communication. 
what you really want to do is understand and empower, not just have an openness checkbox. And third, culture matters. If you want to succeed, build a great culture. And culture starts when you were first starting that, those first interactions on a mailing list, when you're at your first sprint. Culture comes, continues from where it has started. Now, there have been anomalies, technologies that are so attractive or so productive that they've dis succeeded despite a difficult or a toxic culture. But that time is changing. We are becoming more and more networked. We are becoming more and more community-oriented. So now the best determinant of which technology will succeed is not the technical execution. It is not the elegance of the technology. It is how vibrant and is the community around it. If you put obstacles in the path of people participating with you, you put obstacles in the path of your own success. So if you want to grow up to be the PSF, you actually really need to grow up to have a culture of service. I observed a conversation on Twitter a couple months ago where there were some people who were angry that a particular conference didn't pay, didn't pay them for the efforts that they put in. As you know, I observe this very carefully because, as you know, PyCon doesn't pay speakers or, or the volunteers for their service. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here because, as I observe, there are many people who disagree. But I think that the culture of service is the single thing that makes the Python community great. Now, don't mistake me. I'm not saying that people should never be paid when they provide valuable services. Uh, I also think it's wrong when commercial interests treat communities as a source of unpaid labor or contractors that they don't need to pay. That's not cool. I also think it's reasonable to have paid positions that empower and help others. But a group where people only interact when they're paid to do so is not a community. It's a, it's a bunch of mercenaries. And what we have here are a bunch of friends where you reach out and you do a little more and you serve. A community that reaches out to serve and help others becomes richer and deeper and better over time. This is the reason why we reach out to others. This is the reason why we value inclusiveness, is because we know that these people are our friends, or at least we hope that they will be soon. So I actually hope and I challenge that each one of you has found a new friend or deepened a friendship while you've been here. And if you haven't had the chance to do so yet, there's still time. Find somebody, serve them, help them, say thank you, and you will come out of PyCon with a better experience. Reach out and serve another person, and you find a new friend. So I got this question via email. What is the greatest threat that I see to the Python community, and what is our greatest opportunity? There are... Threat, three threats that I worry about most. And they're all related. They relate to multi-core and mobile and package management. Now, I've talked a lot about community-oriented things this morning. And you might think, I'm really worried about these. Actually, the Python community, I think, is the best community out there. I think that we, we're not perfect. Yes. We're not perfect, but we care, and we're trying to get better. But the Python community is actually our greatest strength. What worries me are technical shortcomings that lead people to choose other technologies because Python doesn't fit. Now, these are perennial pain points that become, have become more apparent as technology has advanced. And not to put too fine a point on it, I'm especially worried about JavaScript and Go because they have significant advantages exactly where we are weak. I don't think that these other languages have to lose for Python to win. But every time someone says, I love Python, but I need to do my new project in whatever, I get a little worried. It's because software is an ecosystem. And every time our ecosystem shrinks, the opportunities that are available to us all get diminished. The term software ecosystem was coined about 10 years ago in a book written by David Messerschmitt and Clemens Zbierski. 
in this book, they laid out an extended argument that people in companies, as they interact in a self-interested way, can be thought about and reasoned about just the way natural ecosystems can be. Now, the term stuck, even though the specific roles that they imagined haven't really caught on, the concept of a software ecosystem has. If you're familiar with Redmonk, they're technology analysts. Uh, Stephen O'Grady from Redmonk named his blog Ticosystems because he said every technology is an ecosystem. Now we can spend some time celebrating the fact that our ecosystem has grown so much over the past 15, 20 years. It was actually about 10 years ago that, Pyth that Paul Graham wrote The Python Paradox, in which he said, I'm going to read this to make it right. People don't learn Python because it will get them a job. They learn it because they genuinely like to program and aren't satisfied with the languages they already know, which makes them exactly the kind of programmers companies should want to hire. Hence, for what, hence what for lack of a better name, I'll call the Python Paradox. If a company chooses to write a software in a comparatively esoteric language, they'll be able to hire better programmers because they'll attract only those who cared enough to learn it. And for programmers, the paradox is even more pronounced. The language to learn if you want to get a good job is a language that people don't learn merely to get a job. You listen to that today and it's funny. Isn't it funny that 10 years ago, Python was esoteric? It was, the, it was the unsafe choice. It was crazy and wild and out there. It was the underdog. Today, I swear to you, I saw a, a ranking in CIO Magazine. Now, CIO Magazine, if you've ever had a chance to read it, these people are like 10 or 15 years behind the times. <laughs> and they had a listing of safe software languages to use and evaluate for their next project. And boom, Python was there, number three on the list. Uh, so you had C++, you had Java, and then you had Python. <laughs> but the problem is that there is no more Python paradox. I actually see people who, if they're looking to engage in a Python paradox-like language, you see a lot more Scala or, or sometimes Go or things like that. Now, smart people are still choosing Python, very much, but it's not a risky choice anymore. Now, I'll skip over a lot of the reasons why JavaScript worries me, because they're very apparent, they're easy to see. It has the most widely, it's the most widely deployed language on the planet other than C and C++. Every single person knows how to run it. It's dynamic, it's getting lots of funding, it's an intrinsic part of the web. I'm actually, if I had to put one thing that I'm most worried about, it's Go. Go is close to the metal, it has an easy to understand concurrency model, it's mostly low friction, and it's good enough for a lot of things. And so it becomes, it has a deployment story which is just wonderful. Copy a binary and it runs. We can't do that, not yet. The problem with Go is that, is that any code written in Go is dead code. This is because of the static linking, because of the, they have a strange calling convention, and they use the plan nine as opposed to the C calling convention. Any effort that people put into Go software is locked within the Go ecosystem. Unlike, say, Rust, which is also a really interesting language, there's no way to use Go for the things that it is good at and also use Python for the things that it's good at. It makes Go, choosing Go an all-or-none proposition. This becomes especially clear when you ask the question, well, why wouldn't we just implement a Python interpreter in Go? Could we then take advantage of the work that's been done by others? And the answer is kind of surprisingly no without going through not very performant and not very idiomatic calling out to C libraries, you can't really do the dynamic loading and the things that we value, the dynamicism that we value in Python is just not really possible in Go. It would be hard to create an equivalent ecosystem that would allow us to extend a Go library in Python. 
So what is our greatest opportunity? I think that's easy, that's education. Uh, Python either is or is becoming the dominant teaching language across the world. And it's not even as apparent here as it is in overseas in places like the UK. How many people have heard of the BBC Microbit? A few people. This is a little Arduino style comp size computer programmable in Python 3 that is going to be handed out to every single UK school child next year. Actually, later this year. I want to especially call out Nicholas Tollerby and the, uh, the, UK, the UK Pythoneers because the P they opened the door, so the PSF is actually helping support this effort with the BBC to allow and to support Python programming for all of these school kids throughout the UK. You all know the Raspberry Pi, programmable in Python 3. Universities are switching to it. This is, Python is becoming the place where people go to learn programming. And it doesn't matter if you're, a, if you're a child, it doesn't matter if you're an adult. And this gives us the greatest opportunity to grow and, ha and expand our, our community and our ecosystem for years and years to come. If we are able to address these multi-core and mobile and deployment challenges, we can become the dominant language for years and years and help lots of people be at ever more PyCons in the future. Thank you. Any questions? All right, we have time for two questions. Um, could you could you talk a little bit more about JavaScript specifically as a competitor? Because I've been running into that too, where it's like um, more recently I was looking at the recent JavaScript uh, specs for ECMA 6, and they're actually absorbing Go features, and they're actually absorbing Python features they as part are. of the expansion. So, I mean, that to me looks like a huge threat. So I was really disappointed that the um, uh, Python in the browser talk got canceled. The, so, a couple things. First of all, yes, uh, JavaScript is a, absorbing features, particularly from, Py, particularly from Python. I hadn't seen the Go features. Uh, if you're interested, take a look at the pypy.js uh, talk that's been recorded. It was actually really fantastic. You know, JavaScript, I hear that it's web scale. <laughs> uh, it really ties into, the, it ties into the ubiquity of the web and of HTTP and HTML, and the fact that it was built into every single browser. And the web is becoming the lingua franca for almost everything that's happening, uh, happening in networked applications these days. I mean, even if you think about, we have the, the JSON lib, which is we are using JavaScript serialization. That's, that, that's an, uh, an interesting place where we have actually adopted uh, a JavaScript uh, implementation for things that we do in Python. Hi, there. that was a great talk. Um, mine's really just a, a correction. It's not every child in the UK getting a micro bit, it's just all the 11 year olds, so there's gonna be out. <laughs> that would be chaos. Um, <laughs> that's going to be about a, a, um, a million micro bits, um, and they'll also, it's also going to be uh, an open hardware, uh, an open platform as well, <clears throat> and you'll be able to purchase it at a very cheap price as well. Um, yeah. So, yeah. By the way, everybody, this gentleman is Nic Nicholas. Do you have your micro bit on you? Not on me, in, okay. my ho in my hotel room. So I'll bring it over and people can have a look at it. So. Wonderful. All right, take care everyone, thank you.